Welcome to the Colby Cast, episode 205. Thank you for joining us. Today, Bonnie and I are joined by Kaiser Johnson, an actor, writer, homeschool alumnus, husband, and father. Kaiser sits down to talk with us regarding the love story of creation. From his deepening of his faith as an adult to his becoming an actor to the present, we see a recurring theme of focusing on the work set before us and approaching this with joy. We hope that you'll enjoy the show. Hi there, I'm Bonnie, Colby homeschooling mom of four lads and lasses, liturgical musician, popcorn and podcast fanatic. And this is Steven, homeschooling father of five and chief homeschooling officer for Colby Academy. Stephen, how are you? Doing well, as we're recording here, just in Holy Week, getting ready for Easter. So, good one. It's a good week. Yep. To set the scene for our conversation today, I'm going to take you back to the pre-COVID years. On this particular occasion, I queued up an episode of the Catholic Momcast with Lisa Hendy. I came to learn about this series of videos on YouTube called Catholic Central. So I started watching these videos and found them to be just fantastic to go along to supplement the lessons we were working through in our religion studies, our Colby homeschool religion studies, um, late elementary through middle school. So we would do the faith and life text and the accompanying materials and discussions. And then I would find a video from Catholic Central to go with the lessons we were working on. From there, I began to learn more and more about the folks who were working on the show and one of them is with us today. I'm very excited to introduce Kaiser Johnson. Hi, Kaiser. Welcome to the Colby Cast. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm really, really excited to meet you and get to visit with you. I'll try to uh, rein it in so it's not too obnoxious. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> would you tell us a bit about yourself and your background and interests? And um, from there, maybe a little bit about the, the Catholic Central era of your existence. Sure. Yeah. Well, it all started the day I was born. No, I didn't. Um, <laughs> obviously, it started before then too. But no. Um, so yeah, I so I am a, a, a dad and an actor and a husband, and um, I, I grew up homeschooled, which is uh, a, a big part of a big part of who I am. And and I I came back to the Catholic Church in college and started to jump right into it. This is that was. One of the things that, that drew me to Catholic Central as a, as a project uh, in general was, you know, I remember when I was in college, uh, um, seeing so many people, um, you know, who were nominally Catholic and that kind of thing, leaving the the faith or, uh, and at the same time, I was asking myself all these questions about, you know, God and life and relationships and love and that kind of thing. And, and, and having this first kind of, um, opportunity fully, fully away from the context of my family with which to ask these questions and, and, and deal with them. And I think that's what a lot of people are doing in college and why you see so many people, um, people making different choices than their, their parents did or than their, their parents wanted for them. And for some that's, you know, partying and for some that's, you know, uh, uh, leaving the faith and, and, and doing stuff like that. And it's less because I think it's less because of any actual, um, problems with those things, but just that they go, oh, well, well, now I get to make my own life and, and I'm going to decide what that's going to be. And, and well, the first thing I can think of is just, just to do the opposite of what my life has been so far, you know, and um, that I was certainly a, uh, an opportunity and temptation that, that um, provided itself um, to me, but that um, luckily I was raised not that Catholic. <laughs> so then when I uh, was, was asking, you know, a lot of these, these questions and stuff, and I ran into some Catholics who they had really good answers for, um, these, all the big questions I was asking that I thought were like, Oh, here, here are these big unanswerable questions. Like that, you know, no one's going to have a good answer for like, uh, you know, why is God against, uh, you know, stuff you do in the bedroom if if God, if it's supposed to be if life's so important and stuff like that and Catholics said, well actually here's here's the the good news about uh all that that kind of stuff and I was going oh my gosh this is one you know stuff presented in a way that I've never heard before and two in a way that really makes sense and three I was really really kind of captivated by the beauty and the uh holistic 
um, nature of of Catholicism, and I you know I don't mean holistic in a you know pejorative uh, you know New Agey sense, but in in the sense of like everything. It, it it makes sense of the universe, not just of aspects of the universe. Um, that that uh, everything works together because it was it was created by the creator, and it's just the way that the world is and works. Um, and so maybe I'm speaking in way too general terms there. And and so to uh, that that captivated me, and I found it, and it was astonishing to me the beauty of the theology that I was not familiar with and and um god's love for us and and how he creates us out of love and for love and to love one another and to love uh to love him and and to love each other in the process of loving him i i, I was swept away by this 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 greatest love story of all time that that is god coming down and seeking out his people and I was like, gosh, why, why isn't everyone Catholic? In the end, I think an easy kind of answer to that is uh, um, because our PR is real bad. <laughs> you know, we, we don't do a, uh, necessarily, uh, as Catholics, a great job. And, and a lot of people are doing such great work in, in, in working towards this. But for a long time, you know, we, we've run into this issue of, of Catholics being uh uh, and understandably so, but poor advertisements for Catholicism and also um, not having answers when the greatest answer that, you know, that the, the word incarnate provides himself to us and that it, it's a tragedy that we aren't able to answer those those questions, those things that I thought were, oh, these are the unanswerable questions and stuff that, um, in, in college. And, and so that's something that, that drew me to uh, Catholic Central was it it was you know asking really relatable uh questions that people in in middle school high school and college are are asking and um being able to answer those with the with the beauty of of um catholicism and the beauty of the incarnation <laughs> so there you go i think i was seen on your your bio on on one of the the pages that you were up in Duluth studying at at one point was that you know? that's right yeah I did my undergraduate at not not that I did my graduate anywhere I have not, I do not have a graduate degree <laughs> so <laughs> I did my undergraduate at uh, University of Minnesota Duluth <laughs> so yes it made me think of an, an well a person I lean on heavily of Father Mike up there sure. in the, at the university so and yeah and even like what you were talking about there just the I think people are we're so much better today at this sort of communication. I mean, through things like you were doing with, with your presentations about the Catholics, but like father Mike and all these people about talking beyond just all of the doctrine and, and things even, I mean, so people didn't even know that particularly well when I was young, but, but even the fact of this personal God, this, this God of love that wants that for us wants to enter in a relationship is something that I just didn't hear much about until right. relatively recently. You know, yeah, it's, it's odd. It's odd. It, it is. It's kind of uh, astonishing, and and I think that that it's it's so unfortunate when we look at the God who loves us so much. This is something that blows my mind. Is like this idea of we don't have a need to exist as human beings, but um, God, out of love for us creates us like you go wait wait how, how does that even make sense but that that um god out of this just gratuitous love creates us in the first place and and creates us and and you know you can get a little bit as, as you become a, a parent and stuff you can get sort of a cognate of that of of what it means to to love another so much that that you feel the need to bring more life into the world and and to be so to, to have a way of being gratuitous with your love that that um goes i i i want more more objects for my affection and that that i can i have this love to give and i want to to give it more but it, it, it's this crazy thing and and that i think so much of the experience that and maybe this is, i'm sure this is true in other places too but i think just that that American Catholics in general have this experience of is is not being presented with that, but being presented with, you know, 
uh, God wants you to follow these rules or, or, you know, go to hell. And it's like, well, (laughs) that's coming at the, the understanding of it from the, the completely backwards side of it, you know? Um, and you know, then as, as you become a a parent too, you, (laughs) you I've learned so much after becoming a dad, (laughs) it's like, Oh my gosh, I understand so much more, uh, my relationship with God, God's relationship with me and how, what a bad job I do (laughs) in my relationship with God. And also what a bad job I do as a, as a dad and, and how I, both of those, I go, I want to, love more like God loves me. And, and that I, I think that's not, again, not, not an experience that, that are and not something that a lot of us would initially verbalize or, or come away with is I want to love more like God loves me because we don't necessarily have an experience of, or an understanding of God loving us first and his, his judgment and his, um, in the, the ethos, the the rules that he puts in place, all as uh, as means of his love, which is it, it changes this whole thing. You know, when I like I see my my you know five year old daughter doing something dangerous, and 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 like I go stop, stop that right now, and oh my gosh, you've got to listen to me because this, and it's like um, I don't want to you know raise my voice or I don't want to you know and do that, and it's like, but I need to stop what's happening right now, and and to go. Oh my gosh, is is that, you know, if I feel rebuked by God sometimes in my life where I go, why would you, you know, why are you doing this? And and um if I can take that that 10,000 foot view and go, um, this is God out of love reaching out to me and going, Don't hurt yourself. I love you too much to let you hurt yourself here. Stop. So even these places where we see the the yeah, I, I forget what saint it was who who said it. Uh, it's probably more than one, but just that that the light of heaven and the fires of hell are both the inescapable love of God, and that uh, we get to we get to choose how we experience that um, for all eternity um, if we choose to to let ourselves be loved by God. So, yeah, that idea of if it if I didn't care, I wouldn't. It wouldn't matter to me. I wouldn't do anything if I didn't care right. enough. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I remember something from one of the books of Maccabees, and here I'm showing my my lack of specific scripture knowledge, but where they talk <laughs> about God loves us so much that he punishes us immediately for our our faults mm. rather than allowing us to like the other nations, I guess, at that point, yeah. a- allowing them to fall into further and further sin and further away from him but he calls us back as soon as he can yeah yeah that's an interesting idea uh, the idea of love having um i don't know if parameters is the right word but it is not just whatever you want to do i love equals you do whatever you want and it's fine right <laughs> yeah 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 that love love if you really love me you would enable my destructive behavior <laughs> exactly yeah. that's well said so, oh uh, no quite the mm-hmm. opposite yeah. 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 And I just, I, I, something that in, uh, certainly this, uh, this Lent and, and, um, you know, I've been doing, um, renewing the consecration to Mary here. And, um, I don't even remember if it's more some of the mass readings that we've been hearing or some of the, the, the readings for the consecration and stuff that, that, um, I just keep running into more and more of this, this sense of going, okay, I want to be a better, child in front of God, you know, and I want to be a better, uh, you know, I want to, I want to be more obedient and I, and out of, of, um, and, and responding out of love. And, uh, I actually just today I was, um, <laughs> while I was putting my one and a half year old to, to down for her, her nap and stuff, I was, um, yeah, squeezing in a, a quick rosary because it takes, takes 15 minutes to get, <laughs> get her, um, to bed and, and, um, meditating on the, the agony in the garden and, just this this thought of like uh, again of this this love of God you know the there's that small t tradition that that part of the agony is is um, Christ um, you know experiencing this the sins of of all mankind and and you know uh, I and again I don't know where this small t tradition comes from but this idea that um, all the sins of of history are are present to him in that in that moment and that um, he's going 
yes, for that sin, I will offer my life down. Yes, for that sin, I will offer my life. And and just thinking, oh gosh, I want to, I want to stop adding, <laughs> adding more sins for him to suffer for in the garden. Um, because you know, this is this is our our God who who exists, uh, who transcends time and space, um, enters into time and space, and and so that that it is true that my sins at this moment, if if I make the choice not to sin right now, um, if I make the choice towards virtue right now, that that affects the suffering of His passion because that's something an event that happened in time to a God who is who transcends time. Um, and so that there's there's this way that I can I can ease his, I can make that a little bit easier for for Christ in that moment, and that was just this like I was like oh, hang on I gotta set set my baby down here for a second because <laughs> what <laughs> this is this is this is virtue and and sin time travel happening this is wild so um, but like I have the opportunity to either contribute to to Christ's agony in a negative way or to be one who 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 reduces that burden for him and uh like that's a wild wild thing to think about in in holy week so makes it kind of draws a real draws things into real sharp relief yeah so i don't know if this was the light breezy kind of conversation you were <laughs> now i was looking forward to this i i've heard okay. you on a few other recordings and i've i've been looking forward to like Speaking to that, I I'm curious about um, either side of the Catholic Central, like your homeschool years, whatever you want to share with us from those years, what what you liked about it, what you would say to homeschooling families, anything along those lines. What do you think there? Yeah, well, I think um, first of all, absolutely, yes, homeschool is awesome, and and I I am so glad to have. Um, uh, that is a huge gift that my parents uh, gave to me. Um, uh, you know uh, throughout my whole life. I mean, there was, I did all, all told, I, you know, I think I, I did the year of eighth grade, not homeschooled and, uh, and half of first grade, not homeschooled, but the rest was, was homeschool. And, and, um, this just remarkable gift of, um, uh, one, my mom's time, um, that I didn't, you know, necessarily realize just, what a gift that is. But now, again, now that I'm a dad, uh, <laughs> <laughs> realizing like what an intensive um, focus it is, e even just in putting together, um, you know, we didn't have uh, like the idea of of curricula that was not, not a big thing at the time. And so, um, you know, it was really largely basically my mom putting things together for us and going, okay, we're going to get your math from here and we're going to get, you know, this from here and here are books for you to read that, uh, you know, will help contribute to your ability to, to read and to write and to, uh, you know, do all that kind of stuff. Um, and her really putting that together and, and also in the process, us really learning, um, the skills of, of, uh, self-sufficiency to, to some extent of, of learning how to learn and how to critically think and how to um, reason to, you know, and, and going from a place of, okay, I don't understand this material or I don't understand how to do this. And then the question that I think by and large as a society we've lost is how can I understand this rather than just like give me the knowledge you know <laughs> just yeah. let me and so this this um you know my dad when he was teaching us both um math and he he would help us with math and science um uh like once a week and and also you know eventually helped us with uh, test prep and that kind of thing and he said you know the the thing that you look at is in in critical thinking is what do i know and how can that help me understand what I'm being asked? Um, and this idea of like, that's kind of central to, to reasoning is, is, you know, what, what do I know? And, and then how can I use that to um, understand better what I'm being asked? And um, that that's something that applies way beyond getting ready for the, the PSAT. <laughs> and uh, yeah. you know, I, like I was, shocked when I got to college and, and like, there were people who, 
um, like like there was a every it was a required course that everyone had to take intro to college learning, which is here's how to take a class. And it's like, shouldn't you figure that out in the last 12 years is, you know, how to how to how to learn? Um, and uh, apparently not, you know, and through some good negotiation and and uh, demonstration, uh, I got out of taking that class because uh, we were able to demonstrate that I did not need it uh, <laughs> because I already had learned in homeschool how to learn. And, and I was astonished that so many people that I knew had never they'd never they had no idea how to do laundry how to cook how to clean because they had always had someone to do that for them and they and and they didn't know how to learn it either it it didn't make sense you know and, and this is again but like i was started college before uh before youtube was a thing <laughs> and so um Nowadays, people probably just go how to do laundry and put that into to YouTube. But um, uh, back then, it was like they're like, I, I don't know, well, how would you even start? <laughs> like, well, yeah. um, start by I don't know, looking at what you know, and then looking at the machine in front of you and putting it together. You know, figuring it out. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, I would say that that ability to learn and and to approach unfamiliar situations and not be thrown by them. Um, is a huge uh, gift that that uh, home homeschool and and uh, you know my mom and my dad uh, have have given me. So, and if that if if that's the only thing that I got out of twelve years of schooling, that would be uh, that would be enough. But it's but a lot more. <laughs> so, sure. So you're an author. You're an actor, voiceover actor. All all those things. Tell us tell us about all that. Sure. Yeah. So, well, so I went to college for acting. Um, I got a bachelor of fine arts in, in acting at, in, at Duluth. Um, and, uh, then I moved to, uh, Los Angeles, um, because, uh, yeah, since I was in about seventh grade and I, uh, heard, I went to a, a, a play, a, a professional theater show in Minneapolis where I, I grew up. Um, and I, you know, there was a Q and A afterwards, and one of the actors said, uh, "You know, well, you know, kind of in passing, they said, you know, oh, well, we're actors, so this is our job." And I was like, "Hold on, stop, pause. <laughs> this is the job. You can do. This is what you can do for a living. Uh, sign me up." And uh, <laughs> so uh, from that moment on, I was like, I, "That's that's what I want to do." So from seventh grade on, I was like, I, "Acting. That's that's the thing." Um, and I wanted to do TV and film. Um, and so I, I moved to, uh, to Los Angeles and have been doing what actors do, which is a lot of, uh, you know, the in, in between, cause you know, even very, very, very successful actors spend most of their year unemployed. Um, and, uh, and it is, it is thoroughly a gig job unless you are on a, uh, a series regular on a show. And even then you're spending the whole hiatus unemployed and that kind of thing. But um, so doing, you know, uh, a, a fair amount of acting and lots of voiceover and, and that kind of thing, but um, also doing other stuff in the, in between times. It's an interesting thing to have a career, um, a job and a vocation all at once and um have it, tried tried to figure out how to have them all serve in in you know ascending importance what <laughs> uh vocation first career second job third and how to make that all work so you've talked about the acting and voiceover and also your writing so i i mentioned the book that i had noticed you had published you have since published another one so how did how did that all come to be your your writing Oh yeah, so actually that came th about through kind of tangentially through Catholic Central. So um we went to, one of the first years that Libby and I um through Catholic Central went to we went to the uh in Anaheim there's the religious education congress mm -hmm. um every year and it's a huge gathering of 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 Catholics and uh, especially um people involved in um teaching in in Catholicism and um so really cool event and um Libby and I met um, some folks from uh, our Sunday visitor at um, uh, at at their end. Uh, Jamie Wolf, who was there at the time, she's now at at Ave Maria uh, Press. But um, 
you know, she said, I, you know, I liked the show. And, um, would you, have you ever thought about writing a, a book? And, um, like if you did, what would you write about? But just you and Libby seem to, um, and cause Libby and I also worked on, um, on some of the writing of it and, and, uh, of, of Catholic central. And she said, you know, you guys, ha you've got an interesting voice and an interesting, um, perspective and you, and you've got this, uh, audience who are, are interested in hearing what you've got to say, well, would you write a book? And, and, and I said, I haven't really thought about it before, but if I did, I'd be interested to write basically uh, kind of without realizing it pitched um, grit and glory, which is a book about faith and fitness. And also in that moment also talked about, you know, my ideas for uh, a, a book about all the mistakes I have made <laughs> in my life and, uh, and, and the, uh, how how I've listened to um, how, all the bad advice I've listened to, which th that would you know become my second book called um, uh, How to Be Miserable and Alone. So so uh, she was like, I'm really interested in the faith and fitness one. Let's let's talk about that. And so we did, and, and uh, she gave me this kind of template tool of of that that our Sunday visitor used to have authors pitch them ideas for nonfiction books. And so I I, I uh, filled out the template of, gosh, here's here's what this book would look like and and they said, yeah, okay, we like that. We'll we'll publish that. And so then I had to write the book, <laughs> and so <laughs> uh, so I did. Um, and uh, it in it was kind of a cool opportunity um, for me too to really delve into um, this deeper understanding of uh, who I was as a person and who who we all are in, in this human nature that we've been we've been given. Um, and I I, I would have been struck by both in in writing that book and in uh writing uh how to be miserable and alone is how even in like so so often i go gosh we should know better you know yeah. <laughs> um it, and and i guess it like practicing catholics um it, it you know we i think it's so it's it's still very easy for us to fall into um some some wrong notions so we, i mean to to use the proper word heresies um that we you know we have this idea of these these confused notions about when it comes to you know faith and fitness uh i, I look at it and, and go we've drawn this artificial separation between body and soul even in our catholic culture of this idea that there's this um uh the supremacy to the 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 spiritual that does not affect the body or vice versa and it's like it's not even actually theologically proper to talk about body and soul as though they were distinct entities you know um peter kraft says uh he talks about you know as we we are in incarnate souls and he says you know that's why both uh ghosts and zombies are so disturbing to us is because um, one is a, a soul without a body and one is a, a body without a soul. And that, and, and why death is so, you know, in, in um, the gospels where it says, you know, Christ snorted in spirit is the literal translation of when it says he was, Jesus was greatly perturbed when he sees uh, Lazarus in the, you know, Lazarus in the tomb. And saints have said, it's because how wrong death is like, death is 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 wrong it's not it, it is a it is a a material evil um it's it's not supposed to be there because it's it separates something that's never that it should always be one it, it takes a, it takes a person who is soul incarnate and turns them into body and soul uh so that that um that's that there's not supposed to be a separation there so that anyway that's that was one big big takeaway that i ran into in 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 this that we we treat our physical life and our our spiritual life as though those are two different things when we should be united as a as a person and know that the the things that we do with our body that th those are actions of the soul and and vice versa as well so with your experience as an actor or your life as an actor and then author and doing these things, it's interesting because when I, I've been thinking about that area in particular, and this is coming out in what you're talking about, but that's an area that unlike so many things just requires en enduring, you know, putting, putting aside uh, most of the time it involves putting aside immediate gratification, 
to a certain extent to be able to i mean this this is with musical instruments with acting whatever because you don't just like start it and then it's like oh now i'm i'm there i'm i'm done i've got <laughs> i've got what i need it's i mean there might be a joy in doing some of those things but it's sure. usually a struggle a struggle to get to some place but there's the perseverance in it and so when you're talking about fitness when you're talking about um these actions the virtue basically you building towards these things it's just really interesting to me because it's it seems like it's so different than kind of our popular idea of those areas of acting or being a musician or being in front of people that it's like oh it's all instant gratification but right. i think it's exactly the opposite it's it's being able to put off those things for so i mean for most people it's putting right. off those media goods for a greater good down the road you know those things but yeah, absolutely. I, th I think, and I think you're right that it that it is um, that that, that it, it affects kind of that idea of of being able to delay gratification or put in a lot of work um, that we don't necessarily sensibly see the 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 payoff of. Um, that's that's central to not only fitness. It's central to if you want to have a, a career in a difficult field um it's central to um raising a family um it's central to uh living out life on earth in this you know in this valley of tears uh, um that the world is um all of it requires um persevering to the end and that that for for a lot of those, our obligation, our call to um, to difficult work and to suffer um, out of love in every aspect of our life, that the 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 end point of that is entry into the kingdom of heaven, and so we are not relieved of our duty until we die. And there's, you know, it can be like, oh man, that's, that's asking a lot. Or it can be this, this kind of beautiful call of, of going, this is, this is the, this is the call. This, this is the job. Um, and the job is, is, uh, offer all the sufferings that life presents you, um, in, at the service of good, at the service of love and at the service of God. Um, and offer all that back to to him and it will be worth it and praise god we get glimpses of that and, and in in this life you know um but as uh chesterton's great character father brown says um we're on the wrong side of the tapestry um so we get hints of of beauty and of grace and that we're contributing to something um, meaningful, um, but that we we don't we don't see the full picture of it. Um, you know, we're on the wrong side of the tapestry. We see the 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 loops of of thread, and we don't see um, the great picture that God is drawing uh, with our life and the lives of of all those that we come in contact with and 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 love. Uh, but again, we we get these glimpses of that, and uh, you know, I I I, I mentioned in. Um, this experience that I had in, in um, uh, my other book, um, How to Be Miserable and Alone, um, there was, so uh, I mentioned it in other stuff too, but this this idea that um, I remember having this experience once when I was going through a, a particularly difficult time of, of uh, suffering, of uh, experiencing a lot of uh, kind of rejection across the board, um, both in my uh, personal life and and professional life and um and feeling like it was happening in my spiritual life too and then um i had this this you know i roll my eyes anytime anyone anyone says the word vision um but you know it's, it call it a, a vision or a daydream or a whatever but just this this sense of um seeing more than i had seen before and and this just was presented with this image of of myself as a, as a, an old man and um standing with 
someone who I presumed is, you know, was my, my wife who was an old woman and, um, generations of my family in front of me, my children and their children and, and their children's children. And, and above all of it, the, the, the roof over our heads was, was opened up and, and the whole Milky Way galaxy was, was in, in more than that. It was like a tear in the roof was tearing open the the universe and and just seeing this this power of the creative love of god pouring down in to myself and my family and that that this this idea that um suddenly there's this difference of understanding of going this is what i have planned for you and it might not look exactly, you know, like, like this is, this is, this is an, an image of that. This is an icon of, of that. Um, but that, that what I have planned for you is, is a life of creativity, whether that's in a, a, a creative life giving love. And so that th this, this God of the universe is, is, is speaking to, to, to me at the time and, and to anyone else who will hear saying, you know this this God who made the stars, made the the sun, and and the the moon and the earth, and uh, you know wildebeest migrating across Africa, and he looks at us after creating all of this and goes, "Okay, your turn. Okay, you try." And that that's the purpose of our lives is to live this life giving love, and for all of us that is that is a, a call to holiness. For all of us that is a call to leave the world with more life than, than we were given, um, with more love than, than we knew that we had, um, to make it a more loving place, uh, by, by having lived in it. Um, that's our call to holiness. And, and it may also come out in different ways for people who are called to married life, um, to bring children into the world for priests or religious, um, to create and to give in, in those ways. And, you know, for, for artists, it may also mean that, uh, uh, that there's a creative love that's, that, that causes them to create things of beauty that remind people of the love of God and, uh, and show that to them. Um, but that all of us are given that task of this is, this is what I have created out of love. Now you try important to keep that in, in mind uh, is, is a number of things that you've talked about just reminds me of of those those trips to confession where <laughs> at one point a priest was saying you know what is it that god is already providing to you and wants and wants to offer you what are what is it that he's offering you that you're rejecting in order to find a more immediate mm -hmm pleasure or good in this because you always choose you always choose the good even though some of the things we choose are ultimately evil but but what is it that you're desiring god's offering that to you but why are you why are you choosing this instead of what he's offering you and so that that longevity that you're talking about there about just keeping that that idea that god's calling was calling you or calling all of us to create to part to participate with him in this yeah. to to walk with him in that and so often it's just like, no, no I'm going to go do this little uh, self-destructive thing over here instead yeah. because it's, it's immediately hard. Gratified, it's hard. But, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. 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 Choosing, choosing um, consumption over creation, um, choosing gratification uh, over truth in and of themselves, you know, gratification is not necessarily a, <laughs> a bad thing. Um, and, uh, and yeah. Um, consumption is, is, uh, you know, con consuming things or not, you know, if, if anyone who's involved in, in, for instance, education or, or in entertainment or in any of those things, if we don't have people consuming education, consuming entertainment, um, well, the creation of it doesn't matter. <laughs> so it's not to, to denigrate those things as aspects of it, but when we, when we make that our, our modus operandi, uh, when we just, when that is how we approach the world is, is, um, consumption at the expense of creation and, uh, uh, you know, pleasure at the expense of truth, um, and jadedness at the expense of beauty and that kind of thing. Like, like 
Um, I mean, I guess jadedness is always that way, but, <laughs> but uh, uh, I think that that really, it, it's, it's very easy to get into that mode and um, it's not a good mode to be in. <laughs> The other way is a good yeah, mode. Kind of slippery slope too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Chesterton says uh, a man might conceivably uh, achieve uh, a steady level of good, but uh, but not of evil. Evil is a road that goes ever downward. Mm. So true. All right. So drawing upon your experience in and lessons you've learned, drawn from a lot a lot of effort you've put in and life you've lived and to to come to some lessons in flexibility and grit and virtue building i will present you with a hypothetical situation <laughs> oh, of um, homeschooling families addressing some whatever work they have before them students parents i mean it, it gets their parallel tracks or i both the parents and the students in approaching their kind of daily doings there's some resistance to doing that why do we have to do this I don't want to do this. Um, things like that. What what words might you offer uh, to drawing upon your work and and experience to help us kind of look right at that and overcome it? So I will answer that with what I told myself this morning. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh man, because this is you know it's um it, this is not it, it is not something that like. That goes away. The, like the the idea of of being reluctant to um, do the best good for ourselves. Um, I you know I say in my in my in grit and glory. I don't know that I've ever enjoyed a workout, but I always enjoy having done a workout. Um, I've done a lot of um, obstacle races, and um, you know if you ask me, I will say, oh my gosh, they're so much fun. Um, I don't know that they are. They're really <laughs> fun when you cross the finish line and you go, Oh my gosh, that was awesome. I can't believe, you know, but they're not fun while you're doing them. Um, you know what? There are exceptions to that. Sometimes you can get into a great rhythm, uh, when you, it's just the trail run part of it. And boy, sometimes it actually does feel good. Um, but in general, in general, I mean, this is this, you know, period of discipline and suffering that you're going through. And then you go to the end of it and you go, oh my gosh, that was awesome. Um, and that's something that we, uh, my wife and I were just talking about this morning and that I was talking to myself about uh, was, is this idea of um, make a, take, take a vow outside of, of being in the moment and go, this is what I'm going to do. And, and then just start on that decision, just take action towards that decision. So like tonight we were talking about, okay, we are really wanting to do some writing. Uh, she and I write together now and, and um, we have not written together in, in a long time. And uh, also we have four baskets full of laundry that uh, have, have not been folded and are stacking up in the corner of the house. So we said, okay, here is the vow for tonight. The vow is, um, me, Kaiser, I will fold laundry and be what we call the pacer. And while you will sit and type, you'll be the writer, I'll be the pacer. Because whenever people are writing together, there's the pacer and the writer. There's the person who's putting it down and uh, contributing their own ideas. And the, the other person who's just going, okay, well, this this is what we need to do. And, and, and that kind of thing. And we said, okay, we're going to do an hour of that. And, you know, uh, come heck or high water, I can promise you at 8 p.m. tonight, um, no matter what else I have figured that I want to do instead at that point, which will probably be like, I just want to sit on the couch and watch a show um, because, you know, the the kids are still not asleep. They should be, <laughs> but they're not. And uh, And so, but instead, what I will do is I will just pick up one towel and I will fold it. And I will put the computer in front of my wife and I will say, open up a document and start typing words. It doesn't matter what the words are, just start typing them and just take action into the thing that you're supposed to do. Um, whether it's meaningful action or not, as long as you take action towards it, you show yourself that you are keeping your promises and that you are keeping the vows and doing the work that's set before you. Um, and, uh, as you do that, it becomes easier to continue to do that. 
it, it, even just in the moment, it becomes easier to do that. Uh, I remember listening to, um, I think one of Father Mike's homilies and stuff, and he was talking about a, some study where they said like, if you could, the people could form a, a a habit of fitness if they, if all they did was put on their shoes and step outside the door. And they didn't, you know, for the first week, they didn't have to take one step past outside the front door. All they had to do was put on their shoes, step outside the front door. And then what they found out was this, you know, huge percentage of them were like, well, I'm already on my shoes on and I'm already outside the front door. I might as well take, I might as well walk down to the end of the driveway and back, you know, and, and stuff. And then pretty soon you're running around the block and pretty soon you're running miles um, because you took, you literally took that first step. And if you take action before you have the opportunity to second guess that, um, you just go, this is what I said I was going to do. I'm going to do it. Even if it's just this, even if I just start, if I do nothing else, if I do nothing productive, if I do nothing meaningful in this time, I at least did the first thing that I said I was going to do. Um, and I think that that comes down to, uh, I, uh, uh, acting coach of mine said, action precedes motivation. Um, that you discover your motivation after you've already taken act, started to take action. And I think it comes down to like what, you know, St. Paul talks about, about <laughs> this idea, that, you know, he's, he's already in his, you know, seventies or, or something at this point when he's, he says, you know, I, I, uh, bludgeon and subdue my body for the sake of the kingdom, you know, stuff like that. Just so that he's like, I've got to every day. I'm still um, having to go. All right, let's let's get at it. Let's you know whip whip myself into shape here, it, so that um, I I I make the right choices instead of just sliding into what's easy. And I guess that's something that that I think I'd like to incorporate more with like my kids of going, okay. Yes, we look at this room and we go, it is a mess. Um, or we look at you've got 20 problems to 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 do in your in your you know math book. Um let's just do this one, or let's just put away this one thing. Um, and I'll be there with you and you do that, and then we'll see how we're doing, and we'll go again, you know. Um, like uh uh was it Anne Lamott's Bird by Bird, I think. I've never read the book, but just that story. There's a story that I know that I have heard recounted to me secondhand of of this kid, you know, her her brother had left uh this whole project of uh till the day before it was due of it was supposed to have, you know, 48 profiles of birds and stuff. And the dad, the dad just goes, Okay, bud, bird by bird. Let's start with one and we'll go from there. And just that if we take action we will discover, we will find motivation. And pretty soon, uh, you know, we're, we're doing things that, um, we wouldn't have thought possible just because we did one small thing that kept a promise to ourselves. Like the scope of what you're doing there, because I, and you know, I have this problem myself, but I think it's fairly common that, you you set that initial goal too large, and then, yeah. as you say, just just like in your example, you you are the sort of person who puts on their shoes and steps outside yeah. in the morning. It does this. If you set those goals too big, you're the person, the sort of person who fails at whatever they seek to do, which is right. a bad. I mean, so you're you're destroying yourself by setting the goals too big. It's like no, just just take that first step, take that yeah. first thing. Don't worry about you know, I want to run a marathon, start by walking to the end of your driveway or stepping outside. Yeah. And yeah. In, um, imitation, imitation of Christ, um, Thomas Akempis talks about, you know, he says, he relates a story of, there was this guy who was filled with much anxiety and he, he prays before God. He goes, I'm, oh, I, I, I'm filled with all these anxieties and concerns. And like, I don't know what your will is and stuff like that. And, and God responds and says, if you did know my will, what would you do? And the guy goes, oh, okay, uh, I'll, I'll do that. <laughs> it's like you, just that if you just, again, yeah, take those those small actions, it it reduces your anxiety. It changes your vision of who you are as a person. Like you said, you're I, I'm the person who puts on my shoes and steps outside. And 
maybe I'm maybe I'm the person who who takes a couple of steps down the driveway tomorrow. And and then well, and then the next day, well, I guess I've discovered I'm the person who goes for a run around the block. And well, I and then yeah, pretty soon you go, oh my gosh, I'm the person who just ran a marathon. And uh rather than going, oh man, I can I, how am I supposed to run 26.2 miles? I I can't do that. Never mind. Forget it. Yeah. It's too hard. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of being that person, you're the person who yeah. did one small thing and just kept doing small things until they, you know, little things with great love, as Therese of Lisieux might say. This has been a fabulous time together. As we're coming to the end of this time together, do you have any advice you would leave for aspiring writers or actors, particularly for whom their faith is central to them and would like it to remain so, but would like to enter into perhaps the entertainment industry or uh, similar, any any industry, really? <laughs> uh, any any words of wisdom there in that regard? Um, I guess I would say in general, um, if you are someone who aspires to have art as a career. And I think that, that acting is an art and writing is an art and, um, uh, and writing in particular is, is there's, there's, um, writing is the only part of the entertainment industry where, where one, um, creates out of nothing. Um, and the rest of it, uh, this is, I'm totally stealing the part of this book called, uh, kill the dog, um, that I just started reading, but, uh, it, that everything else is an interpretation of uh of the creation of the the writer but but all of it is creation and uh all of it is um like there is creation in interpretation and and uh there's elevation in interpretation and um for all of it do the creative thing at least a little bit every day i think so many of us look at the creative fields and go, well, you've got it or you don't. And if you got it, you don't have to work at it. And, uh, you know, you just like, it's just, you just got to get the business part of it figured out and, and stuff. You just got to get somebody to pay you for it. And then you're a professional, but that's not your call as a Catholic. Your call as a Catholic is to be great, to demonstrate and live out and transmit truth, beauty, and goodness in everything you do. And you do that first by being really good at your craft because uh, that's the only way that people will be able to be influenced by the truth, the beauty, and the goodness of of what you're doing. Like, if your call is to creation, and your call is 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 to do something creative, then you've got to do do it. Do some part of it every day. Be really, really, really good. Make things that are good, and true, and beautiful, and the rest of it you'll figure it out. <laughs> like, like, um, if you have stuff and you share stuff with people that is true and good and beautiful, um, that will find a home. Um, do the work that God has put on your heart and, um, he will find a way for people to, to hear it. Um, just do it and keep doing it. And if you find that you really go, you know what, even in the having done it, I don't actually experience joy in this. Like I said, it, it, it's one thing to go. I don't experience joy, joy in the doing of it. <laughs> um, so you may not experience joy in the doing of it, but if you don't experience joy in the in the having done it, um, then maybe that's maybe it's not your call. Um, you know, I, there's there's this kind of persistent advice of given to actors is if you can do anything else. If you can do anything else, do that um, because this requires an intensity of work and effort and suffering um, that <laughs> you may not ever uh, see the uh, the fruits of. But again, that's kind of the call of life is that it requires an intensity of work and effort and suffering um, that you might not see the fruits that you want or the fruits that you expect out of it. Um, but there's, I think there's a jaded way to say, if you can do anything else, do that. But I don't mean it in a jaded way. I just mean, if you can do anything else, that's probably what you should be doing is doing that other thing. Um, because if you don't experience this, this great joy at having done it, regardless of the results of it, uh, it's probably not for you. So 
I, for most of my life, I've had this, uh, I've hated auditioning. Um, and I had this shift a few years ago of, of this, like the audition may be the only part of the job I get to do. Um, for most of the time, you know, you hear about actors who famously have had hundreds of auditions in between booking a job for on camera jobs. If you, um, audition between 20 and 50 times and you get one job out of that, um, that's a pretty good batting average. Um, for voiceover, if you audition one to 200 times and you get one job out of that, that's a pretty good batting average. And so just this realization of um, this audition is an opportunity for me to act. Like this This is the job. This is the job. And this is this is what I get to do is is breathe life into a character and take them from the page to reality. And... Um, how dare I, how dare I, uh, treat that lightly? How dare I, um, resent that? Um, this is an opportunity to create something and make it real. Um, and if this is all I do with it, I have done my job for the day and I've done my, my work for the day. And so now it's totally changed the way that I approach auditions and my auditions have vastly improved <laughs> because of it. Um, and my, you know, the ratio at which I get called back and book things has greatly improved because of it. Um, but that's not the reason I did it. The reason and the reason that those have improved is because I started treating the thing as the thing um, that I go, that is the job. We're not practicing for some other, other job, you know, um, like that, that's, that's the job is, is auditioning. And, and, and again, it's one of those things that trans translates into to life too. Like, um, it, there, there's uh, that, you know, thing of, uh, if, if you pray for patience, God will give you opportunities to, to be patient. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and this, this sense of like, we, this is not practice, for something else. This is, this is the life that we have and, and, uh, be in it and do it and make something good and true and beautiful. And God will do the rest. Fantastic. Kaiser, what, what a real gift it has been to get to visit with you today. Uh, thank you so much for all of you, have, all that you have done to help us along our own paths toward holiness and, and build growing in virtue and, and, grit and everything and we really appreciate it know of our prayers for you and your family and thanks so much for coming to visit with us thank you it's been my pleasure and uh yeah we'll take all the prayers we can get so <laughs> thank you subscribe to the colby cast on your favorite podcast app so that you don't miss an episode and let us know how we're doing by leaving a rating or a review and as always feel free to email us at podcast at colby.org mary our mother pray for us St. Maximilian Kolbe, St. Ignatius of Loyola, Holy Saints and Angels, pray for us. Ad Maiorem Dei Gloriam.